Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to worship. We are sorry for um, our technical difficulty. As I just said, this is a good reason to be in worship um, as opposed to simply uh, worshiping with us from home. Um, sometimes we have, uh, we have glitches. But uh, it is good that you are all here. And um, as, uh, as, as we continue to open up and more and more people venture out and, and feel comfortable coming to worship, um, I, I look forward to, uh, to seeing you all. And I will also say that there have been people who have been worshiping with us that aren't actually St. Luke Union Church members. And um, I look forward to meeting you. I look forward to, to having you uh, in worship and know that you are, are always welcome as well. But this is Palm Sunday. This is the, uh, the marking of the beginning of Holy Week. This is a, a glorious celebration of, uh, of Christ coming into Jerusalem um, for, uh, for what will be a, well, a very, uh, I won't call it adventurous, but very uh, active uh, week in the life of the church. Um, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. <clears throat> when Jesus and his disciples were approaching Jerusalem at Bethpage in Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Just say this, the Lord needs it and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found the colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? And they told them what Jesus had said and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest! Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple, and when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Blessed is the coming kingdom. Hosanna in the highest. Let us stand and sing our opening um, procession and prelude. <laughs>
as we uh, are sitting here on this glorious Palm Sunday, let us confess our sins to God, whose steadfast love endures forever. I invite you to join in our prayer of confession. It's on the screen or in the bulletin. Um, uh, or if you have logged on, it is there as well. We confess that we have sinned. And although we would like to deny it, we have forsaken you. We are horrified by the suffering we cause to you, ourselves, and the world you have created. Open the gates of your forgiveness and restore us in your love. For the sake of our Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. I invite you to, uh, to turn inward and, and seek forgiveness of God for, for whatever you are holding in your hearts. The Lord God helps us. We will not be disgraced. The Lord God helps us. Who can declare us guilty? Sisters and brothers, beyond the shadow of a doubt, your sins are forgiven. By the mercy of Christ, let us stand together, together, forgiven and free. us today. We do have youth though. You don't have to come forward. Just enjoy the message that Reginald will bring us. Reginald, can you please come out? I'll try not to scare you this week. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> Hello everybody. Hello Pastor Andy. Hello kids out there in TV land. Yeah. Yeah, last week I kind of scared you because I jumped up before it was time. Right. You did scare me. That's right. Hey, hey, but you know, I'm, I, did I miss it? What'd you miss? Well, well, it's Palm Sunday, right? Yeah, Palm Sunday. Well, That's what all palms are for. So Jesus was here? <laughs> um, well, we celebrated the, the coming of Jesus into Jerusalem. Oh, good. I thought I missed it. Right. But the, the choir processed. They were like a parade. Oh, yeah. That's always fun. Right. Hey, you know, I'm really looking forward to next week, Pastor Andy. Yeah, Easter. Easter. Yeah, that's right. It's the time of year when I get to replenish my candy supply. <laughs> really? That's what you're celebrating? Well, yeah, and more. But it's the time of year I get to have peeps and chocolate eggs. And I get to eat the ears off the bunnies. And jelly beans? And jelly beans. Yeah, because why? when did you run out of candy? Oh, about Halloween time. It's been a long time, right. And there's not much more candy in my dish anymore. Oh, no. Yeah, I, I had my own stash of candy, and then I just kept coming in your office and taking them and taking them and yep. taking them, and the only thing left you have are unsalted peanuts. Yeah. <laughs> That's really boring, Pastor Andy. Sorry. It's healthier than candy. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, it's, there's a lot that's going to happen this week. As uh, we're celebrating Jesus coming into Jerusalem, but we have to get ourselves to Easter, and Easter is not. Remember what? Let me go back up. Remember when we talked about Christmas? Oh yeah, that's the time when Santa Claus comes. Yeah, that's that's not what we celebrate at Christmas. We celebrate the birth of Jesus. Oh, that's right. Right. So Easter is when we remember the Easter Bunny. No, that's just a part of it. 
well, that's not even a part of it. It's kind of a something, I don't know where we picked the Easter Bunny up. Um, but on Easter, well, we remember Jesus' death. Oh, that's right. Yeah. You know, sometimes I get confused on, on what I should pay attention to. Christmas is Jesus' birth. birthday. And Easter, Easter is about Jesus' new life. New life. Dying and going to heaven. Ah, oh, well, thank you. I almost forgot about all that. Right. Candy and Easter bunnies and eggs and... Oh, those are all sweet. They're sweet, but they're just kind of extras. Well, can you forgive me for losing sight of what I should be paying attention to? Wait a second. You said forgive you. Of course I can forgive you because when Jesus dies and goes to heaven, it's because we are forgiven. All of us? All of us. Even when we've done bad things? Even when we've done bad things. Or thought about Easter as a time for chocolate and bunnies. Okay. Pretty cool, huh? It is cool. I'm glad that, that, that I'm forgiven. What about you? Are you forgiven too? I'm forgiven too. And so is everyone out there. Oh, well, that's, re that's a good thought. It's a great thought. Mm-hmm. Okay, so what's Easter about? Not Easter eggs and candy. But? I can still eat them. You can eat them. But it's about Jesus. And? And Jesus. And forgiveness. And forgiveness. We'll work on that. Okay. okay. <laughs> All right, let's pray. Let's pray. Dear God. Dear God. Thank you. Thank you. For Palm Sunday. For Palm Sunday. And for Easter. And for Easter. Knowing. Knowing. That we are forgiven. That we are forgiven. Every time we make a mistake. Every time we make a mistake. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Thanks, Pastor Randy. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. So the liturgists always tell me that it's really hard to follow him. <laughs> Maybe it is. Pray with me. Come Holy Spirit, source of all life. As we hear again the story of the passion, let the same mind be in us that was in Christ, who was a servant, that we might be free. Awaken our ears, open our hearts, and sustain the weary with your word. Amen. Our, our first lesson, it's going to be an Old Testament lesson, found in the book of Isaiah, chapter 52, and it's um, starting in verse 15, or 13, and then ending in chapter 53, verse 12. And as I read this, listen to the, the prophecy. Listen to what this, uh, the prophet Isaiah is speaking to um, in these words. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high. Just as there were many who were astonished at him, so marred was his appearance beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of mortals. So he shall startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which had not been told them, they shall see. And that which they had not heard, they shall contemplate. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. And as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne out of infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole. And by his bruises we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was opposed and he was afflicted. 
Yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep that before its shears is silent. So he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice, he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgressions of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich. Although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days through him. The will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. His righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. It's the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This is Palm Sunday. It is a, uh, a day, it's a celebratory day. 
it's a celebratory day because it is the, the marking of the, the, the grand entrance of Christ into Jerusalem. And um, I'm going to jump off script a little bit here in that I'm not going to read the, the gospel lesson. Uh, I read it at the beginning for our call to worship. I'm actually going to read the, uh, the passion story um, and the book of John, chapters 18 through 19, verse 42, which means it's a pretty long passage, but I promise you my message will be shorter. Um, but the reason I'm doing this is because we always celebrate Palm Sunday, and then oftentimes we don't get back into church or to worship until Easter morning. So we have Christ coming into Jerusalem in, in a grand parade, and then we have an empty tomb. And if you don't come to morning prayer on Friday morning, or you don't look it up, you often don't have an opportunity to hear um, what the gospel tells us and what Christ went through. So I am going to share it with you. Again, it's a long reading, but I promise that uh, the, uh, the, the message behind it will not be quite as long. But let's pray first. Heavenly Father, we give uh, great thanks for Christ's glorious entry, for all that will take place this week. Um, let us walk with Christ. Let us understand the, the significance of the gift that he has given us. Let us um, understand what happens on Thursday and on Friday before we can get to the empty tomb on Sunday. Amen. So here you go. You can follow along there or you can follow along in your Bible at home or the one that's placed in front of you. But John chapter 18, starting in verse 1. After Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the Kindred Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees. And they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, Who are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell on the ground. Again he asked them, who are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, put your sword back into its sheath. I am not to drink the cup of my father. Am I not to drink the cup that the father has given me? So the soldiers, their officer, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First they took him to Annas who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who would advise the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to, to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, You are not also one of the men's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, 
I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing by struck Jesus in the face saying, Is this how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, You are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, the cock crowed. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourself and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom was from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked, what is truth? After he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him. But you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, No, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him saying, Hail, king of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to him, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die because he has claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to release you? The power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. 
From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be the king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bent bench at the place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now, it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, here is your king. They cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate asked him, shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, we have no king but the emperor. Then he handed him over to be crucified. So they took Jesus and, uh, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to the place, to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him. And with two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read the inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priest of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write, King of the Jews. But this man said, I am the king of the Jews, Pilate answered. What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. Then they took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes amongst themselves, and for the clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, In order to fulfill scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop, and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great sublimity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and then of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this was terrified, so that you also may believe his testimony is true and he knows that he tells the truth these things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled none of his bones shall be broken and again another passage of scripture says they will look on the one who may have pierced after these things Joseph of Arimathea who was a disciple of Jesus though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission. So he came to, be remo so he came to remove his body. Nicodemus, who had first come to Jesus by night, also came. 
bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about 100 pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices in linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified. And in the garden, there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Again, I, I wanted to read the, the Passion of Christ story today in, in this Sunday's worship because unless, unless we seek it out, unless we specifically go and look for it at some point during this week, um, it, it gets glossed over and uh, we get past Monday, Thursday and Good Friday and, and we never hear it. And the next time we gather today or gather to worship, the, it's, it's an empty tomb. And uh, it's a celebration, but we need to know what is taking place. It's, in, it's important to know and hear the words of Scripture that tells the story of Christ's crucifixion. They're important because they portray a picture and they give us an understanding of what Jesus went through, what Jesus endured, all so that we could be forgiven of our sins. So what type of portrait then? What type of portrait do we each have in our minds about the, about the passion story, about the one I just read? What, did, what do you picture um, took place? Now, interestingly enough, for, for centuries, there have been attempts to figure out exactly what Jesus looked like, right? What he looked like. And this has been, well, it's relatively impossible. And it's been little success in, in what exactly Jesus looks like. I mean, it's because we never know. There was no paintings of Jesus. There was, there was no photos. There was no carvings of what Jesus looked like. I mean, we don't know. I mean, the selfie wasn't invented for 2,000 years. And I checked. There is no Jesus Christ Instagram page. But that's not to say that, that the effort, the effort hasn't had some value. The effort in trying to figure out what Jesus looks like. And, and it, it brings us a bit of understanding. See, we know that because of this search of what Jesus looks like, we know that he was a young Jewish man born and raised in Judea in the first century. Right? We know that. And that he probably looked somewhat familiar with the people that he was around, the people who lived in that region at that point. And because of the research through, well, modern archaeology, we have a good idea of what physical characteristics most men at, at that point in our history will possess. Although personally, I, I have to admit that I have always enjoyed how Jesus is portrayed in Christian art. The Art Institute in Chicago has a wonderful collection of Christian art. And what I found is in those art pieces, there's a tendency. There's a tendency for the portraits of Jesus to look surprisingly, or maybe not surprisingly, familiar to the artist who painted them. It's also likely how we each have an image of Jesus in our own minds that resembles one that closely looks like us. So in picturing Jesus in any but the most general sense, we really get no help from the Bible. I mean, we, we've got some archaeological ideas, but the Bible really doesn't explain what Jesus looks like either. And this is because the Bible shows very little interest in physical traits of a person. Um, but it's more, more a general sense. We get a kind of an overall sense. It's like when they describe what David looked like, um, King David, they called him ruddy. I don't know what ruddy looks like. Maybe someone can help me. Um, maybe it's, you know, what movie star-ish looking. But that's the, all, that's the only description we get of David. See, what we have to do um, to understand Jesus and what Jesus looks like, we have to search for moral descriptions. In that people are, are described in Scripture by their actions and by their words and by the decisions they make. 
This is true of numerous biblical figures. It's especially true about Jesus, especially as we read through the Gospels. The moral portrait of Jesus found in the Gospel, you see, is what guides us in knowing the true Christ, the one that we hold in our hearts. It shows us why we need, why we need the cross. We need this cross to get ourselves to an empty tomb and how we are allowed to see Jesus' love for humanity in, in simple spoken words and, and through the acts of his hands. This is what I mean. Jesus is on the cross, yet as we read through the, the long John passage, as Jesus lays on the, sits on the cross, he speaks. He gives wisdom. He gives insight to, to his true moral character. Here's what I mean. In today's reading, the first, he first says, he speaks three different times. And the first address is two people standing below him, below the cross. And he says this. He looks down at his mother and he says, woman, behold your son. Then he looks at his disciple, what is called the favored disciple. We think it's John, we're not exactly sure. And he says to John, he says, behold your mother. What does that mean? Well, this is revealing because Jesus hangs on the cross, agonizing in death. He, there, you, at that point, unites two people. <coughs> two people in, well, one who is going to need some help as a woman in the first century. He reveals that, that they need to be together. He formulates a new relationship between his disciples and his mother. A relationship of love and care. Then from his dry mouth, the second thing he says, the words that come out is, well, I'm thirsty. I'm thirsty. A simple statement of fact, yet I would say a massive understatement given the pain that he must have been, follow, must have been flowing through his body at that point. See, what happens then is a simple act of kindness. A simple act of kindness from someone that you wouldn't think it would come from. You didn't even have to get it from. One of the soldiers, one of the soldiers who crucifies Jesus soaks a sponge in a nearby bowl of, of what's known as sour wine. He puts it on a stick. He raises it to Jesus' lips. A small comfort to us, perhaps, but, but truly a refreshing um, to someone who is in such agony. Yet his words about thirst and, and this act of mercy encourages. It encourages and finds significance in the words throughout Scripture. It, it really reflects the, the way Jesus is. It reflects a message that is, that is that found throughout Jesus' his life. It's almost as if he's quoting Psalm 22. <clears throat> because in Psalm 22, if you've read that, I encourage you to read it. It begins in a, as, a, as a psalm where the, the author seems to be abandoned by God. But it concludes with a note of hope. It concludes in a note of triumph. Because in Psalm 22 it says, In my thirst they gave me vinegar and wine to drink. But that psalm ends again with triumph and hope. So in Jesus' words, you see, we become more aware that, that he accepted his torment freely. Not loving the pain, but loving the Father and loving the world for which he agrees to die for. Jesus is thirsty, even for sour wine on a sponge, but he is more thirsty for the redemption of the world. And finally, the last thing he says, Jesus receives the gift of wine, and then he speaks the third, for the third and final time. He says, it is finished. It is finished. Now we need to realize these words are not about the end of something, but rather it's about the completion of something. The completion of the ministry of Jesus. The goal, you see, of his ministry being accomplished and his life purpose now realized. This is what Jesus announces as finished just before he dies. See, with his life, 
all that God the Father has sent him to do in the world is not finished, it is now complete. And it's the result of Jesus' life that, that prophecies are fulfilled. I mean, John goes back and says, this is why Jesus said this. This is why Jesus said this. Prophecies are fulfilled. The power of sin is broken. And this is finally realized. And the work of his lifetime has been accomplished. It's, it's the salvation of the world. This indicates the salvation of the world. Theologian Mark or John Marsh claimed that these three phrases can be identified as the very center and heart of the Gospel of John. Why? Because they state succinctly the triumphant story announced by the Gospel of John. Here, the cross is not a defeat that must wait for Easter morning to be reversed. It's already an instrument and a sign of humanity's victory. It's not something we should brush over. It's something we should, well, perhaps not embrace, but acknowledge and understand. Woman, behold your son. Behold your mother. I am thirsty. And it is finished. Three simple words that offer a true moral portrait of Jesus. True because in them we can find how Jesus is is filled with compassion, accepts and bears our pain, and crosses the finish line of life, uh, a life that is triumphant. It may be useful for us to each have a, a physical portrait of Jesus. There's lots of them on the internet. I knew my Sunday school room had one. My grandmother had one in her house. And we... We, we have these pictures based on, on perhaps the archaeology that, that can best help us. I mean, but there are images everywhere, right? I found one on the internet with Jesus in toast. I also found Jesus in a slice of orange uh, on the internet. It's great pictures. Go look them up. But I would say it's more important, it's more vital to learn from the pages of Scripture is is what Jesus did, what Jesus said, the decisions Jesus made. So instead, that we can have not a physical picture, but a moral picture of whom our Savior is. See, a physical portrait of Jesus answers some of the questions about him, but a moral portrait of Jesus answers them all. Celebrate this day. Celebrate this day of triumphant entry into Jerusalem, but walk with him to the cross this week. See the true portrait of his life and the grace and the mercy that we have received. It's the only true way to arrive at the empty tomb and his resurrection, which is coming just a week from now on Easter morning. Amen. I invite you, when the music starts, to stand and sing with us.
Palm Sunday, there was one offering that we always um, encourage. It is our one great hour of sharing. Um, some of our children have been putting loose change in fish banks. Um, I encourage you, if you've done that, to, to bring your, your banks into church um, at some point. And we'll, um, we do have a few here. But uh, also, thank you. Thank you for continued support and, um, and your generosity for the ministry and the mission here at St. Luke Union Church. Um, and as you are uh, in your pews, I invite you to enjoy a special musical offering by our bell choir. I invite you to, uh, to pray with me this morning. Heavenly Father, glorious Son, Holy Spirit, we have now begun Holy Week, a week where we are encouraged, invited to walk with you, not only victoriously into Jerusalem, but on our way to, uh, to Monday, Thursday, 
Good Friday, all before we get to Easter morning. And help us to understand that, that Easter is not simply chocolate bunnies and jelly beans, but it is a, a celebration of all that you've done for us. We're going to the cross so that we can be forgiven of our sins and showing your grace and your mercy forever. Lord, be with us and guide us this week. Help us to be symbols, illuminations, words, encouragement of, of those who we, we touch and we meet this week. Give us patience and perseverance. Give us hope and give us mercy. And as we, as we look this week, let us give thanks. Let us give thanks not only to the most wonderful gift that you have given us, but let us give thanks for, for our abundance, for our families, for those whom we care so dearly about, for positions of, that we can work, for accomplishments, for, for challenges. Be with us and guide us and keep us. Lord, let us simply reflect on you this week. Let us find a new quiet space to hear your words and your way so that we can share those words, we can share that way with everyone we touch. We ask your blessings and your grace, and we ask that you accept the prayer that your son taught us when we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. I do have a few announcements, uh, not, not a lot at this point. Um, next week, or I should say all week, uh, we will be having morning prayer here in the sanctuary at 8 o'clock. It will also be live streamed if you want to join us as well. And what we're going to do is we're going to read scripture. We're going to pray. Um, Marsha Henthorne is going to offer some music um, for us as well. It's not going to last more than um, a half an hour. Uh, more likely 20 to 25 minutes, so uh, please join us. And then on Easter morning, Easter Sunday, we're going to have two worship services here in the sanctuary, um, one at 8 o'clock and one at 10.30, uh, and that is to, uh, to, to, to accommodate uh, more people. Um, Easter is a, is a glorious uh, Sunday as, as, as far as a pastor is concerned. Easter is our Super Bowl. Um, and we want to be able to accommodate whomever wants to come and worship in person with us. So 8 o'clock and then at 10.30. Only the 10.30 service will be live streamed for that as well. Um, no one else is raising their hand. Youth, we are having youth starting at noon. If you are watching, get over here. So, Judy. Monday, Thursday. Monday, Thursday. Um, yes, thank you. Monday, Thursday, we will have a worship service as well, here in person, as well as live stream, and that will take place at 7 o'clock. We, we will also be sharing communion um, on that day as well. <coughs> Easter morning, we will not have communion. Even though it's the first Sunday of the month, we will have it the second Sunday of the month. We have confused everyone now. <laughs> but let's stand and sing.
Today is the Sunday that we celebrate Palm Sunday, the day of Christ's glorious and victorious entry into Jerusalem. But it marks the beginning of a week that will, will lead to the cross, a cross that we have to approach before we can get to an empty tomb. So may God the Father, God the Son, and Holy Spirit be with you today, tomorrow, throughout the week, and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.